Witness tells committee that ESG is just another way to transfer wealth from the poor to the rich. Welcome to the Canadian Shield. My name is Sterling. I'm your host. The Sustainable Development Committee is looking at the ESG, which stands for Environment, Social, and Governance. The neo-Marxists' way of trying to convince you that by spending more money, you'll be able to clean the environment. Actually, that's really not happening in, in the way that you might believe, and then we, we're not able to track what they do want you to believe. However, there is a lot of money leaving from the people who, who don't have much going to the, into the industries and the people that have a lot. So they brought in one of these industry experts to ask him some questions on ESG. And what he said is very eye-opening. Are Canadian depositors at risk if the government mandates ESG ratings or climate-related disclosure statements on financial institutions? If you're going to ask banks to do something, you've got to ask who's paying for it. Bankers are. It's not coming from bankers' personal wealth. The market cap of the of the five biggest Canadian banks collectively will be a drop in the ocean of the cost of meeting climate change. So if you ask banks to bear this cost, and what I hear when I hear that is you got to lend to green energy companies at below market rates. Because if it's at market rates, you don't need any of this stuff. If you're going to ask banks to do it, guess who's going to bear the cost? It's going to be depositors. Because just like everything, the amount of money that you deposit, the bank takes that money and puts it into investments. So if they need, if they need more money to, to pad those investments or if they need more money to pay for the regulations that the governments install or initiate, then the depositor is the one that's, that ultimately is paying that. Be, there's no other way around it. I mean, the bank doesn't the bank doesn't use their own revenue. Remember that all of these large companies, whether they be the bank, whether they be a bank that's investing in a company, whether it be the company itself, they all have shareholders, which you would hear in your day to day as mutual funds, right? As fund managers. So they will ultimately have to recover those costs. I mean, it's, it's basic mathematics, right? It's, it's first level stuff. If you have a certain cost that has to be covered and then the money of the profits has to be coming out of that. So if the bank is forced to invest more money, or lend money at below market value, that money has to be recovered somewhere. Whether it be done at $10 per person or $100 per person, it absolutely has to be recovered because they have shareholders that they need to keep happy. And anything else, any other thought about it is simply naivete. Will government regulation of ESG scores and climate change disclosure statements on financial institutes, institutions have any impact in reducing emissions? Well, even the ESG services have no idea what ESG measures. ESG is the most diffuse, undefined. It's like nailing jello to a wall. <laughs> if ESG services have no idea what they're measuring, how the heck are governments going to require companies to follow ESG rules? It's a recipe for disaster again. So would they would be basically no way to reduce or to, to measure the way how many emissions are being even reduced? Well, they can they can disclose whatever they want, but if you look at the net effect, it doesn't seem to match up. In fact, if you collect up what companies claim they've done, and then you look at the output and say, why isn't it showing up in the results? There's a there's many a slip in the cup and the lip. Disclosing this doesn't seem to show up in the final numbers. And I think that's a question we've got to ask is why after 20 years of forcing companies to disclose this and more so in the last few years is nothing changing on the ground. It's almost like what they're doing is ineffective. That's what he's saying. He's asking if, if we're doing all of these things and we're putting all of these regulations and then we're having companies try to, you know, run around getting an award for being the greenest, why is it not showing up in your day to day? And I'll tell you the biggest reason why is because as soon as they leave the regulation of the North America or Europe, they don't care. All of that stuff goes out the window. So they'll dump it in the water. They'll dump it in the ground. They'll throw it up into the air. They don't care. They're not following those regulations and they're not well versed. So those, it's not not even like we can say that those countries are doing it maliciously. They simply just don't know. They're not aware of the amount of poisons that are, that are spewing up into the air and they're in very short term thinking. Because when you're living in abject poverty, when you're working for your government 
on a, especially when it's a neo-Marxist government that's forcing you to work for very little bit of money. You, you don't have the time to be worried about those kinds of things. And that's exactly where we're trying to oh, bring a light to the fact that the Canadians and, and while well, Canadians are going through all of these struggles for this ESG, this carbon tax, all of these environmental virtue signaling, while it's making no impact on the, on the bottom line, we are going through a lot of hardships because of the neo-Marxist liberal government. Well, I say liberal, but that's only in name only liberal government that we currently possess. Putting us through all of these efforts and draining every nickel that they can get out of us, every single nickel. I mean, it, it, it's really very, very uh, disturbing to think that they can witness it happen and not care. Yeah, thank you. Uh, you referred to an ESG gravy train in one of your presentations. Can you explain this term and explain how banks and consultants benefit the most from ESG scores and climate-related disclosures? You know, BlackRock was very much up in front during this ESG train early on. Like Larry Fink said, the world will not be safe if we don't have ESG. So I took BlackRock's sustainability fund which is a fund built around ESG. And I compared it to their regular fund. Out of the 500 stocks of the regular fund, 497 showed up in the sustainability fund. The difference was BlackRock charged five times more for the sustainability fund than the regular fund. You look at fund managers, you look at bankers, you look at consultants, every one of them has an ESG arm and the ESG arm makes money by selling this notion to people and again, with the idea that you can be good and be more valuable at the same time. I mean, they they just took the stock and rebranded it and then charged more money for it. They didn't make any changes. They didn't make any improvements because don't think in your mind that they're being, like they, you, you want to believe that these people are doing the right thing, but really they, they have a different motivation. Their motivation is to make profit. If they can get you off their back while they make profit, then they'll do so. If they can take something and turn it a few words and then try to brainwash you into thinking that they're doing the right thing and it just happens to be five times more money. I mean, where does that money go? Does that money go to cleaning up the environment or does that money go directly into the pocket of the shareholders and the, and the board of directors of BlackRock and any of a dozen fund management companies? I mean, we always talk about how much has not been put in. I mean, that's what you'll hear Stephen Gilbo go on about, oh, well, we've stopped this many tons going into the air. And yet... These experts that read the air quality, they know that there's no changes in those levels. So where is all this extra money going? But you know what it's coming from? It's coming from the bottom, people at the bottom, because the bank put your money in a mutual fund and all of these things. And now you put in, you know, your 50 bucks, your 100 bucks every paycheck or every month, and that money gets accumulated and passed on to these funds. And these funds use that money to invest in companies. Now they're charging you five times as much because it's green. Because it's ESG, because it's this simply the model of Marx rebranded. Thank you. Does improving ESG ratings or climate-related disclosures increase value or decrease risk in any proven way? None that I can see. Of. I've heard, as I said, I've looked at every single research paper in this space. The, the papers that do are advocacy papers masquerading as research papers. I mean, I live in the value space. That's what I do. I value companies. I'm still to value a company where ESC has made the company more valuable. It can make it less valuable. But when ESC makes a company more valuable, it's because it's PR, it's marketing, at which point you're gaming the system. You're encouraging what you call greenwashing by pushing that idea on companies. Which, of course, this is just another way to say you're getting companies to pretend that they're doing something while they're not. They're, they're doing a market, uh, like a commercial, a uh, market push, propaganda, we would call it, where they're trying to convince you that they've done something, and yet, so you'll buy their product. And then that's how they turn around and generate more money. But all they've really done is put the cost up. So when the cost goes up, then we can say, they say, oh, look, we're making record profits. Well, of course, you're making record profits because your prices are 10 times as high as they were just four or five years ago under the guidance, guise of this ESG, this uh, environment, social governance. If we were really trying to look after this problem, we would be tackling the, the manufacturing of it. We wouldn't be telling ourselves that we can invest money into a company and somehow that makes us green. There are ways that we could be going green, but... There are ways that we can go green, but it's not in the way that we're handling it. And certainly by destroying the middle class, we're not going to get there at all. 
Thank you. You stated in the Financial Times, and I quote, it serves ESG advocates to keep the definition amorphous since, like the socialists of the 20th centuries, whose response to every socialist failure was that their ideas had never been properly implemented, the defense against every ESG critic is that it is incorrectly defined or implemented, end quote. What did you mean by this? You have 30 <laughs> seconds, uh, Professor. I have a lot of blowback on that one. <laughs> the truth is that because ESG measures, you put 100 ESG people in a room, they come up with 100 different definitions. So whatever your critique is, they say, that's not my ESG you're critiquing. Very convenient, but not very, you know, it's not very honest. It's not intended to be honest. It's, tenant, it's intended to make you continue to spend the money. It's intended to make you follow, you know, the doctrines of the, environment or of the Marxist religion. It's in, it's intended to make the far left seem like they're making accomplishments while in reality they're not. And when they, when they, when they are confronted by their lack of improvements or their lack of acknowledgements, they try to hide behind the idea that they can tell you that it wasn't done correctly. Well, you were standing there the whole time. So how come you didn't make sure it happened correctly? Why didn't you initiate it and do it correctly? Well, it's always somebody else's fault. It's just like Justin Trudeau. You see it all the time when we talk about these leaders who stand there in the House of Commons and say that it wasn't their fault that the plan that they initiated, the plan that they conceived, the plan that they um, contrived, and the plan that they took time to, to write legislation for didn't work. And you're like, well, it hasn't worked so far. Oh, no, well, it's not our fault that it didn't work. It's always something else. It's always this, you know, gremlin, this this ghost in the machine kind of kind of logic that only serves to cloud the question and muddy the water of solution because we can't get to the solution if the methods that we're employing are not functioning correctly and throwing money at a problem that you think you can avoid being accountable for is not solution to anybody's problems. It's simply a, an illusion that ends up hurting the, the common person. I mean, the only the the poorest among us are getting poorer, the wealthiest among us are getting wealthier. So how does that, how does that translate in this ESG? How does that translate to these neo-Marxists? How does that translate to anything other than a massive wealth transfer from the top, from the bottom to the top? And then they, the bottom, the top comes in and tries to buy out the bottom, like we see in examples all over the world. So there's a lot of dishonesty in the entire um, theater, right? We have to, be willing to call them out on that because obviously making life more expensive for Canadians is not solving the problem. So let's start somewhere. Let's, you know, that let's abandon that plan because it's not working. Put money back in everybody's pockets and then we'll try the next thing. We'll try a different thing. We'll try something else. There are other examples that are functioning on this earth. The ones that we are chasing do not work. All right, I'm going to wrap here. I want to thank you for listening. I'll talk to you next time.